everybody let's go ahead and dive into it so today welcome to ignite your email three steps to drive more revenue from email marketing you want to start with some introductions our speakers today are kelly olson and lauren rugg kelly is our senior director of email marketing she is a total pro kelly would you like to say hello yeah, hey there, everyone. Um, I have about 10 years of experience in the digital marketing space, most of that focused on email, also on SMS. I'm really excited to talk to you about some cool strategies today. Fantastic. Kelly's done a great job building the email department, really growing here at Ignite and doing fantastic work. Also, Lauren uh, is a senior manager of email marketing here, also with some very notable experience. Lauren, would you like to say hi? Yes, hello everybody. Um, I come here with about 10 years experience in sales and marketing and five of those years focusing on the digital customer journey and um, focusing on lead gen email automations. And so definitely very excited to be here today and teach everyone a little bit about email. Fantastic. We've got some really, really advanced email marketing strategies today. I've reviewed the deck. I think you're going to love it. Everybody is going to leave here a better email marketer with more strategic knowledge. Really excited to have these two speakers. My name is John Lincoln. I'm CEO of Ignite Visibility. I've been doing digital marketing about 16, 17 years now. Absolutely love it. And uh, this stuff just is, uh, it's kind of my mission. You know, the better we do, the more we get to give back to clients, employees, and the community. Um, just absolutely love digital marketing. But let's go ahead and dive into it. So, Kelly, what are we going to be covering today? Go ahead and walk us through our agenda, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So, first, we'll start off um, talking a little bit about the power of email. Then we'll dive into the three steps, right? So, we're going to start with on-site email acquisition. We'll move into welcome and nurture automations, and then we'll close out with some best practices on abandonment automations. Awesome. And as you can see, those bullet points there are going to be things that are going to notably increase conversion rates for everybody's website who's on the line today. Really exciting stuff. So Kelly, go ahead and kick us off. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start us off talking about the power of email. I mean, most of you wouldn't be here, right? If you didn't know that email marketing is a very powerful channel, that's why you're here. You want to learn a little bit more about it, right? And how we can optimize it. So email really is a catalyst for cross-channel acquisition and retention. It does a great job of capitalizing on your acquisition channel's ability to drive traffic to your site. And it then takes the leads and nurtures them down to conversion at one of the highest ROIs out of all the digital channels. So I won't go through all the stats here on the slide, but just to call out a couple of things. I mean, for every dollar you spend on email marketing, you can typically expect an average return of about $44. Um, email is also about 40 times more effective at acquiring customers than Facebook and Twitter combined. And one of the most important stats I'd like to call out is that 320%. So about 320% more revenue is driven by automated emails versus batch sends. And we will go ahead and talk about some of those automations today, and hence why we really want to focus on those when we're talking about increasing revenue from your email program. You can see here just how powerful that is. I just feel so many people don't understand how powerful email is from an ROI channel. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So we're going to jump right into the first step, right, of driving more revenue, and that is on-site email acquisition. So what is on-site email acquisition? Well, it's what we call any way that you are acquiring email addresses on your website, right? So that could be things like email capture pop-ups, nano or sticky bars, footer captures, gated content. You could be collecting on your checkout process, your e-com. There's a lot of different ways people collect email on their site. And and this is one of the key parts of driving revenue from your email program. And it's so important because without a list, right, we have no one to email. And so we could be building the most beautiful emails, the most sophisticated automations, and they're really not going to do anything for you if you don't have people running through those flows and receiving those emails. So the first step and most important that we recommend to all clients is focusing on your on-site email captures how are you converting all that traffic that's coming to your site and getting them to sign up? There's a lot of different ways to capture this that we'll walk through today. And a lot of those can be very, very powerful. So let's jump to the next slide and we'll look at one of the most common captures, which is the email capture pop-up. You could also probably hear it called an overlay or a modal, but I'm sure 
you've seen at least one example of this on some websites that you shop on, that you browse, right? It might even be on your own brand's website right now, and fantastic if it is. Um, this is still one of the highest converting opt-ins um, across all that could be on your website. The expected conversion rate is typically anywhere between three and 10%, of course, three being the minimum we would expect to see there. And we have had you know, some brands that we work with that have seen higher than 10%. It really depends on one, the quality of traffic that you're driving to the site, and two, your specific audience and what incentive you are offering in exchange for their email address. So one of the best practices that we really want to call out for your pop-ups that you want to focus on is if possible and where possible, right? Include an incentive. Um, that could be something like free shipping or a dollar percentage off the first purchase, or it could be a free ebook or a guide, right? Or signing up for a free webinar or demo. There's a lot of different ways you can add value in exchange for someone's email address. So try to think of some sort of incentive to include there and you'll see much higher conversion than if you do a more generic sign up language. The other point that I'll call out here is to keep fields and the data that you're requesting on that pop up to a minimum to keep your conversion rates high. You really shouldn't have more than two max three fields on these pop ups um, because you're going to start seeing a drastic decline in conversion rates there. Of course, it's all up for testing, right? This is just what we've seen as best practice across the clients we work with. But Definitely test it for your brand. See what converts at the highest rate. Is it one field? Is it two fields? Is it three? Um, I know everyone wants to get a ton of information from their contacts right off the bat, but know that there are other opportunities within welcome and nurture automations that you can actually ask for additional information. So the first and most primary goal that you want to do with these is getting that email address uh, collected. So the second capture we'll talk about is a welcome mat. So a welcome mat is a cousin of the pop-up, as I say. It's very similar. It's basically just a different version, right? It's a full screen, quote, pop-up, you know, that grabs attention the moment a user lands on your website. It typically does convert pretty well, five to 7% on average. I've seen a little bit higher as well, um, though it's less intrusive than a landing page, right? So you could be driving traffic to a sign up landing page where all, the only option is to sign up or go off of the page. In this case, it's a little less intrusive because it actually just sits at the top of your website and the user can actually scroll down out of the mat. Um, so it doesn't affect user experience as much as if you landed them on a landing page. This doesn't work well because it isolates the call to action and it grabs attention pretty quickly. Um, but I would recommend testing this type of variation of a capture against your pop-up in an A-B test See what works best for your particular audience and your brand. And the next one we'll talk about here are nano bar captures. So um, you might have heard of these as like a sticky bar or static bar, but basically it's a small, looks like announcement bar, right? That sits on the top or even the bottom of your website. It follows the user along their journey um, on your website. And it has the fields where someone would put in their email address actually embedded in the bar there. Now, you'll see the expected conversion rate is a little bit lower, right? So you're seeing one to 2%. But what you have to realize is this is actually most powerful when used in conjunction with a pop-up or a welcome mat, right? So you don't just want to use this on its own. You can, absolutely, but you will probably see an expected conversion rate right between one and 2%. Again, that can vary based on what incentives that you have there. Um, but it's best used when you have a pop-up that fires, right? When someone comes on the site, you're getting maybe 90 to 95% of your traffic that actually closes out of that pop-up without entering their email address. So this is a great way to add incremental signups to your list with someone still on the site, right? They might not have signed up on the pop-up because they just weren't ready. They don't know, like, it's my first time on the site. I don't even know if I like the products or I don't know if I, I'm interested in the service yet. I need to learn a little bit more. And then after browsing a few pages, they realize actually, you know, I am very interested and I wish I had that pop up back with that incentive, whether it's 15% off or free shipping or, you know, a free ebook, whatever it is. Um, and of course, they can't get that to trigger again. So this is a great way to still be able to offer that in exchange for an email address. And kind of two birds with one stone here. It can also help with conversion rates. So if you're e-com and you're trying to sell things on site, this is a great way 
to offer an incentive here to prompt higher conversion to give people you know 10 percent off or free shipping right before they purchase so it's it's definitely a very powerful addition despite its lower conversion rate and now i'm going to pass it over to lauren to walk through some additional captures thank you kelly um the next capture that i will be speaking about is the footer capture and all right, so it may not be the highest converting um, at less than 1%, but it's definitely still worthwhile because it is absolutely not a heavy lift. It is super simple to implement, and you will see some incremental conversions over time. Um, as Kelly was mentioning, if somebody didn't uh, interact or sign up for the pop-up or the welcome mat, and then they are perusing your site and decide, hey, you know what? shoot, I wish I did get that 15% discount. Um, the savvy shopper will know to scroll down to the bottom of the page and that incentive should be in line with the pop-up and then they will be able to receive that email um, automation with the code. And that brings me to a tip to make sure that this is properly set up. So you wanna be sure that this form field is properly set up with your ESP or your email system provider so that it is going on the correct list and then also ensuring that it is going on the correct automation and triggering that welcome series or nurture series. The next uh, email acquisition uh, strategy is one of my favorites. It's the gated content and it works really well in the B2B space. This is um, typically somebody who will be searching on Google, trying to find an answer to a question, or they're exploring your website and they're trying to solve a, a problem or again, answer a question, and they come across some gated content. Um, this is great for the marketing and sales department because you are receiving a lot of information about one person and they typically are stronger leads because they did take the time to fill out this information. Um, but the key here is that it must be value-driven content. So you want to ensure that this content is answering um, a question to their problem. It will solve their problem. And this may be their first time interacting with your brand, most likely. So you want to ensure that this piece of content is really polished. Um, and these different types of content include white papers, videos, eBooks, case studies, demos, um, webinars, I mean, the list can go on, but the main point is that it is value driven and that it is polished. And also you want to ensure that it is triggered immediately from your ESP once the form is submitted. They are receiving that email that includes the downloadable content, as well as once they hit that submit, they're going to a success screen, and then that link is there right away um, to ensure that you know you have given you've promised and they are receiving what you have promised that you will be giving right away instantaneously just a quick note on this one i love doing industry studies as well we do industry studies here for for clients who would like us to do those i, I love doing it once a quarter having a, having it downloaded downloadable in the b2b space it's so powerful but really it can work for any space so uh, just another great piece of content that you can gate Absolutely, yes. And in our last and final, which is actually the winner of the um, expected conversion rates, is the squeeze page, also known as a landing page. And this can have actually an expected conversion of upwards of 20 to 40 percent. Now, this works very well in conjunction with paid ads, uh, social profiles, even a customer journey on your website that somebody is trying to learn more and they come across this uh, squeeze page and why it works so well is because they can't bounce from the page it is an isolated one call to action there is no menu or a home button to be able to leave the page they either have to click out or submit and what works best as always is providing some sort of incentive as well as keeping those fields short so only requesting the most pertinent information name, email, that really um, works well. And 
that's all we have currently for the email acquisitions. I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Kelly, and we're going to review some welcome automations. A quick note on this, um, one of the things we love to do here at Ignite is, you know, you've got a bunch of blog posts on a certain piece of content, mapping a pop-up to the topic of those blog posts, and then and once they click on that pop-up, kicking them to a squeeze page here for really high conversion rates for a download. So just through this type of process, you know, we can see upwards of 30% increases in conversions. So this stuff really, really works, everybody. Um, Kelly, back over to you. Yeah, absolutely. So now that we've talked about how to get people on your list, uh, we need to talk about what should be firing immediately when they sign up. And what is that? Well, that is our welcome automation. Also, it could be called a nurture automation or welcome series, right? This is one of the most powerful automations that you will have in your suite of automations in a, in a really robust built out program, right? It is likely to be one of your top revenue and conversion as well as engagement generating email series. It really aims to not only welcome the new subscribers, right? And establish that strong branding, but it, it's striking while the iron is hot. Right? It's engaging during that high interest period. Somebody raises their hand and they said, I want to hear from you. This is your opportunity, right? This is your first impression a lot of the time with this subscriber to get them to know your brand, get them to know what you offer, and actually nurture them and encourage them towards that first purchase or conversion. So why is it important? Well, welcome emails have 86% higher open rates than other marketing emails. So really, really powerful. And that just shows you, right, that is such a high interest period. So we've got to make sure that we're taking advantage of that and putting valuable content that actually prompts people to make that conversion in this series. 75% um, of new subscribers actually expect to receive a welcome email now. And especially, I would probably beg to say that that's a little bit higher for those who are signing up on a pop-up, right, with an incentive you expect to see your incentive come through your email immediately. And actually, you know, when you don't get it, maybe you get a little anxiety, like, oh, I need that to make my purchase. So um, it's definitely a consumer expectation nowadays to have that trigger immediately. Um, and those who receive welcome emails have actually shown a 33% higher engagement long-term than those who don't receive any sort of welcome emails when they sign up. So it can benefit you in the long-term as well as right away nurturing to that conversion. Um, welcome emails also have about a 10% higher read rate than other marketing emails. So people will actually make it farther down the email than they do with, let's say, a promotional send or an abandoned cart or anything like that. Um, so again, valuable real estate to pack in what you need to pack in to get them to nurture to that first conversion. It really is your best opportunity to engage your leads and nurture down the funnel um, while they're most engaged with your brand. A quick hack for you. One of the ways we've been able to grow our YouTube so much is our welcome email asks you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So you can get somebody to subscribe to two things uh, through this type of process. So just a really powerful little hack for all of our listeners today. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good point too. And, and we'll talk about how to include um, social content and calls to action actually on the next slide. But if you can get, there's a lot of data actually behind, if you can get new leads to engage cross channel, you'll see longer retention rates and lifetime value actually um, overall. So definitely a, a good point there. Um, great, so jumping into some best practices. So first, I'm gonna talk through B2C best practices because they will slightly differ from what a B2B brand might put out there. So Lauren's gonna go over that in a minute, but first I'll jump through um, what we recommend for B2C welcome automations. And keep in mind that all of this is best practice um, and it's something that after working with, you know, a multitude of brands across different industries in the B2C space, this is what we found works best. But I will caveat, that with, you know, this is a jumping point. Your audience and your brand may be different, right? So you wanna make sure that while you use this as a default, you always want to be testing. So if you ask any email marketer, they're always just gonna recommend you test, but, but that is 100% accurate, right? So you can start off with these kind of best practices here, but test it for your audience to make sure you know what converts best. So the first thing I'll touch on here is the number of emails, right? So we typically recommend the sweet spot is usually between three and five emails within that welcome automation. Really, we say, you know, let's go live with, you know, between three and five, monitor that engagement once it's live for about, you know, one to two months, 
and then determine if additional emails or resends to non-openers may be helpful, right? Are we seeing low engagement rates on certain emails? Are we seeing you know, low conversion rates? Do we need a resend? That's a great time once things have gone live to then adjust your cadence and number of touches. We do recommend triggering the first email immediately upon sign up. Again, like we talked about, that is consumer expectations. So we wanna make sure we're meeting that. Um, spanning the following emails over the next one to two weeks post sign up. So here, what's really important is that you assess your sales cycle for your brand. And what I'll say in the B2C space, typically those brands that have higher price point items, they typically have a little bit longer of a sales cycle, right? People are doing more research, more comparison before they actually make a purchase. So you're going to want to span your welcome series over a longer period. Now, if you have a consumable product that's a, a fairly lower price point, right? Something someone wouldn't really be doing a ton of research before converting and making that you know, purchase, it's low barrier to entry, you might want to start that welcome automation and put it over the first week after sign up. So a little bit shorter cadence there. So what you also want to make sure you're doing is that if you are including an incentive on your sign up, wherever they came in from, right, whatever sign up source, whether a pop up, welcome mat, landing page, if you had an incentive there, that incentive should absolutely be in that first touch of your email. And it should be the primary focus, right? Because what does it do? It number one meets their expectation, but number two, it creates relevance and trust right away. You did what you said you were going to do. So that's really, really important. And also immediately creates recognition for them to say, oh yeah, I signed up for this. I know why I'm receiving this email. Can also help with opt-out rates, right? Um, you'll also want to, if you have an incentive that you have included, include a reminder or a reminder banner within the next one to three emails in that series. And then in your final email, you'll want to include some urgency or last chance language for them to take advantage of that, really just helping push that conversion rate up there as well. And then the last call out here, just for best practices, is make sure that every touch of your welcome series has a clear call to action. Now, one thing and mistake that I see a lot of brands make is packing their welcome automations with content um, and information about their brand, but there's no clear call to action. What do you want the user to do from that welcome email? Yes, you wanna welcome them and explain who you are and what your brand is about, but what action do you want them to take? If there's no specific or clear action that you want them to take there, they're not going to take any action. And you've missed an opportunity, right, to move them to the next step of the funnel. So just making sure that visually you have clear call to actions and that your content is focused on one call to action primarily for those sets. You know, I just find so many people set it up and never look at it again. We, we're talking about email um, automation conversion rate optimization here, everybody. What's what's the open rate? What's the click-through rate? What formats work the best? What calls to actions work the best? If you don't test that, you're leaving um, so much opportunity on the table. Mm -hmm. Yep, good point. And um, here's an example of what type of content you could put into a four-touch series here. So of course, it will be different for every brand and what you're selling. Um, but here's an example. So let's take a look at email number one, right? So this brand may want to include their incentive that they had on their pop-up and some welcome messaging, right? We want to make sure that we are welcoming people to the brand. Um, you could include the brand's unique value propositions, right? So you can see in that first example there on the right, there's some iconized graphics there that really call out how this brand is different um, than their competitors. And they laid it out in such a way that it's very easily digestible for the reader, right? It grabs attention and it makes it very clear. It's not a huge block of text that people would have to read through. Um, and the third part is making sure, and I say here, we say shoppable content, but this could go either way, right? So any type of convertible content, again, just making sure that the user can engage with your brand in some way within that email and it's not just a message, right? So for instance, you could include category banners, right? Or your top sellers um, in this first touch. And in the second touch, you may wanna to start to get into your brand story or how your products are made, um, or if you have any you know, give back messaging that you really wanna get out there. That's a really great opportunity in that second touch to get into that story a little bit more, but make sure you're always pairing it with that convertible or shoppable content, right? Maybe a bestseller product grid, um, or pulling things in, you know, from just like that. 
Um, and email number three, really want to focus on social proof. It doesn't necessarily have to be an email number three, but somewhere within your welcome series, you really want to call out any sort of social proof that you have. It creates trust. Um, it makes people feel, you know, a little bit less nervous about maybe buying or purchasing from your brand. So including five-star reviews, testimonials, case studies, if you have video testimonials, as you can see here on the right, this brand has some great video testimonials. Pull that in, very engaging content, and it really showcases that, you know, hey, you shouldn't be anxious about interacting with our brand. Um, you know, we have these people that will vouch for it. So make sure that you do include though, you know, some sort of convertible or shoppable content, right? So maybe you have called out several five-star reviews and you actually pair those reviews visually with um, one of the top selling products that that review is based on. So there's a lot of creative ways that you can do this. Um, you can also use user generated content from social media, right? If they have a picture of themselves with a the product, or somehow engaging with your brand, you can pull those in as well. And then email number four here, of course, we would recommend um, including the last chance reminder to utilize whatever incentive that was that was on sign up, you know, whether it was percentage off, free shipping, um, anything like that. Make sure that you have a shoppable call to action or a convertible call to action to get that person to go to the next step in your funnel. And then this is a great opportunity too to call out any social media features that you want. You know, if you are active on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, it's a fantastic time to let people know because you're getting high open rates during this series that, hey, we're on these other platforms that you may engage with as well um, and get them to actually cross channel engage there and make sure you have a call to action as well. And this here, if we want to click into the actual visual examples, yep. Yeah. So this is a real life example of a four touch welcome series. Um, I think we've got one more. Yep, there we go. Um, for a plastic surgeon office here, so you can see, even though it's not e-com, they're not selling anything on their site, you can see how they utilize reviews there in the last touch. Um, really important to create trust for this brand, as you can imagine, right, if you're going to get surgery from someone. Um, so really focused on that throughout the series, showing before and afters, right, that social proof, showing reviews, showing the list of procedures that they do offer. And you can see in every single email here, they have a clear call to action, scheduling a consultation. You can see, you know, the type of procedures more before and after. Um, so a lot of great content here. And you can also see an example of the timing, right? So we have the first touch trigger immediately, the second touch a day later, the third touch fires five days later, and the fourth touch fires five days after that. So it really spans the first two weeks after sign up a little bit longer than um, you know we might do for an e-com brand because of course this has a much longer discovery period for a consumer. And now I'm going to pass it um, over to Lauren to talk about B2B best practices. Thank you. Yes, so B2B best practices, there will be obviously some overlap with B2C. However, there are some important call outs that I'd like to run through. So we know that B2B typically has a much longer sales cycle. So this automation series is going to have a longer, more touches as well as more space between the touches. So we recommend about five to seven emails in this automation and over about three to four weeks. And it's really important delivering only during business hours. So Monday through Friday, um, you know, eight to five, However, I will put a caveat here. It's really, really important to test, test, test. So testing times that it's sent, um, maybe Mondays you find people are slow and still ramping up for the week. And then maybe Fridays they're kind of ramping down and checking out in the afternoon. So it might not be the best time to kind of be marketing towards them. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays seem to typically be a nice sweet spot. You also want to ensure that you're coordinating with the sales team efforts and you're not stepping over each other's toes. That's important to um, take into consideration. And also this is your time to really establish trust, credibility and expertise. You want to ensure that this lead understands that you understand their industry and their pain points. And you can do that by um, showing some testimonials which are always important or case studies, as well as some value driven content that we spoke about earlier. Another, another very important call out here is 
I know, I know that people really want to get those calls scheduled or those consultations scheduled. However, these people may be just um, getting used to your brand. They're still in their discovery phase. They're looking at other competitors. And it's really important to provide call to actions that are not asking them to jump right in and schedule a call because you'll lose some engagement there. So you want to kind of pepper in some other call to action such as learn more or see our process or watch a demo where they don't feel like they have to be just jumping on a phone call when they're not quite ready yet. Slide. And here is um, a, an example of a welcome automation content. It's a nice template that one can use. The first email is obviously thanking them for showing interest and um, establishing that credibility that you understand their pain points. Calls to action are those, you know, peppered in learn, learn more as well as a schedule call should somebody be ready because, you know, they did just offer up their email address. So they, and this is the hot period to be contacting them. So they might be ready to schedule that call, but also might still be learning more. Um, the second touch is important to let the reader feel seen. So a lot of B2B um, companies are, marketing to multiple industries. And that can make somebody in one industry feel like the business doesn't understand them. So it's really important that the reader feels seen, that they feel that you understand their industry um, and that you can really solve their problems. Email three, a good idea for a touch point is the, are those testimonials. If you have a nice uh, landing page on your website with more testimonials, you can have them link out there. Also doing a nice little GIF of rotating reviews is a good idea and throwing those unique value propositions in. So most likely they're doing research with other businesses. So this is important that you call out what your differentiators are so that they you stand out against the competitors. Email four, a good touch point if they haven't interacted or scheduled a call yet, um, maybe they need some more education. So really providing that value driven content Maybe they need a white paper. Maybe somebody needs to forward the white paper on to their boss to really get the attention. Um, that's a good touch point for four. And five is creating that sense of urgency. So what are the repercussions of waiting? Typically, when it's B2B, it's they're going to be losing time, right? They're going to be losing productivity, which ultimately they are losing money. So it's important to call that out as well to try to get them to take action and to shorten that most likely long sales cycle. I'll, qu I'll note quickly, you know, this is a really great opportunity to get information in front of this prospect. They're hungry for knowledge, you know, they've filled out the form. What's that video content that you can get in front of them that's going to, you know, tell them everything that they need to know and is going to address all their questions and, and warm up that lead even more. So really important time. And um, another just quick note, you know, if, if space is filling up or if it takes them a while to get scheduled or to get started, you know, that's a great thing just to mention uh, on the urgency side as well. Yes, great points, John. Thank you. And here we have just another example of a five touch series. Uh, I think there's one more actually, um, if you want to click John. And this is utilizing that template that I just spoke about. So thanking them in the first email, kind of showing their expertise in the industry with a nice video, showing those uh, reviews or testimonials, and then creating some urgency. In this, in this instance, this brand was able to um, provide a 15% discount, which I know in a lot of B2B, sometimes that's not uh, able to happen. So creating that sense of urgency is always what the last email is intended to do. And this goes over the logic, which is spanned across a longer period of time, that th those three to four weeks, and only during the weekday, the week, uh, week, <laughs> the days of the week, apologies, <laughs> work week. There we go. Um, yeah, and now I believe that is done with our welcome and we will be moving on to abandonment with Kelly. Yeah, thanks so much, Lauren. So the last and final piece of the first, you know, three low hanging fruit pieces to drive more revenue from your program is the abandonment automation. So 
what is an abandonment of automation and why is it important? So uh, I'm sure you've seen these yourselves, you know, when you're shopping online, right? You've seen a cart abandonment, you leave something in your cart. It's basically an automation that's triggered after anyone abandons something, right? It could be their cart, it could be a specific page on the website, it could be a form fill, you could be in the middle of signing up for Netflix and then lose your train of thought, right? Um, so that is when an abandonment email would fire out. Um, and what's really important here, and I like to call out, is typically people think, oh, you know, this only applies to B2C or e-com businesses. But it's actually not true, and it can be very powerful on the B2B side as well. What's really important is that you take a look at your sales funnel and identify, okay, what are the different points during the cycle, right, where someone could drop off? where they could fall off? Is it after they sign up for a webinar? Is it, you know, they're on a specific pricing page and then they abandon from that page, but we know they're a little bit further down the funnel because they're looking at pricing. You know, so first identifying where are those drop-off points. For e-com, for B2C, it's a lot more straightforward, you know, cart abandon, product browse abandon, category browse. Um, but for B2C, you may have, to, or for B2B, you may have to kind of dig in a little bit more to your sales funnel to identify them. So, you know, and just when we're talking about B2C, you know, the average e-commerce card abandonment rate is about 70%. That's pretty high, right? But emails that are sent within one hour of abandon have over 6% conversion rate. So that just shows you like how powerful these can be. And with these, a lot of the time, the first touch, you know, the first email that's firing out doesn't have an incentive in it. So that's a, over a 6% conversion rate without any sort of incentive in it. So very powerful. Why are they important? I mean, other than just how powerful they can be to get people to come back and convert, you know, 34% of subscribers who clicked an abandoned cart email, for example, completed their order. They can overall increase conversion rates by over 50% when we're talking about abandonment automations as a whole. And then average open rates typically sit around 40%. That's huge, right? Compared to your, you know, normal like batch or calendar sends with click-through rates around 11%. So definitely high engagement, a great time to get people back. Now here, I won't go into too much detail, but this is just a great exercise to do with your brand to determine what type of content you want to pull into your abandonment automations. So first thing you wanna do is you want to identify why someone is abandoning from a certain point in your journey. Um, so this can span B2C and B2B. Now in this particular example here on the screen, this is specific to abandoning a cart. Right. So, for instance, the top five reasons why you're abandoning a cart, there's negative peer reviews, lack of a good return policy, slow loading sites, not ready to purchase, saving the item um, or hidden extra costs like too high of shipping at the end. Right. So utilize that exercise of where you're identifying why people might be abandoning from that specific point in your funnel and then address those points within your abandonment email content. So for instance, in this example, you could showcase five star reviews that dynamically populate per product that they left in their carts, right? You could highlight or call out your return policy, especially if it's easy and free, definitely call that out. Um, give them a limited time discount or incentive to purchase now rather than saving that item for later and let them know that's expiring soon. And highlight any other additional features that might help build trust. So 24 seven customer service, fast or free shipping, anything that's really going to help combat those objections that people have to convert right then. Next slide. So here we're gonna walk through some B2C abandonment best practices. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Lauren to walk through the B2B best practices. So on the B2C side, we typically recommend two to three emails per automation, typically longer if they're further down the funnel. So for your cart abandon, definitely recommend three touches. If you're a product browse abandoned, right? So someone has looked at a product page, but then abandoned there, didn't make it to their cart. That's about a two email series there. And if you're at a category browse abandoned, even higher up the funnel, right? If someone's in a category, but didn't make it into a product page, that's an even, you know, maybe even one touch there you could test into two. So just kind of rule of thumb, the lower in the funnel that they are, the more emails that you would likely want to send. You do want to trigger these quickly. So I would recommend A-B testing between 30 minutes and one hour post abandon for that first email. If you're seeing that one hour is performing better, test that against four hours. Um, trigger your second email 24 hours post abandon and a third if you do have a third in that series. Um, 48 hours. 
You'll also want to dynamically include the cart or browse products that they abandon um, in the email to catch their eye. You'll want to also dynamically link all of the call to actions back to the cart or specific browse and abandon products. Um, and then making sure that if you are going to include an incentive, we don't recommend necessarily including an incentive in the first touch. Typically, you'll see high conversion rates even without an incentive. So why give away you know, what you don't need to? So including an incentive in that second touch with a last chance reminder in the third touch, if you do have a third touch, can be most beneficial to conversion rates there. And then my last like, pro tip here. So if you already have an abandoned cart set up for your brand, but you want to take it to the next level, something that has worked really well for some, some of our brands we work with is segmenting out high value carts from their low value carts. So imagine you have someone with $5 item in their cart and you have someone with $500 worth of items in their cart. Which one do you want to give an incentive to convert to? Um, yeah, so you will want to take your cart again to the next level by segmenting out those high value carts, possibly increasing the offer or getting that incentive quicker within that series to convert more of those valuable carts with a higher AOV faster. And you may not even want to give an incentive to those really low value carts because, you know, financially that may not make sense for your business. Really exciting, innovative stuff here. Just a couple slides left, everybody, and then we're gonna get into our handout and we'll take a couple questions. Yeah, absolutely. So running through these pretty quickly, um, this is just an example of a cart abandoned here, John, if you wanna click a couple of times, we'll show the actual creative. You can see they dynamically pulled in the product there. Um, that first touch does fire one hour post abandon. The second touch going out 24 hours later, really high conversion rates on these sends. And then if you go to the next slide, we'll take a look at a product browse abandoned. So this will pull in dynamically the product that the user was browsing. I think you can click one more time to get that other um, touch there. Uh, the first touch firing at four hours after a browse abandon and the second touch going out 24 hours later. And then on the next slide, we'll take a look at just high level category browse. Again, this is very high up in the funnel. If you are gonna test this, probably would recommend testing this first with just one email firing first. If you see that doing well, add in a second one. Um, the timing here really triggering that first touch about six hours after a category abandoned, and then that second touch going out three days later. Um, you really wanna make sure that you're showcasing your best sellers from that particular category in this, in this type of set as well. And now I'm going to pass it over to Lauren to go through some B2B abandonment considerations. Yes. All righty. So um, B2B abandonment may not be the first thing you think of because there's typically not a cart. Um, so you wouldn't have a cart abandonment for a B2B in the B2B space. However, there are plenty of abandonment options and times throughout the marketing funnel where someone can abandon, which are the form fills, um, potentially a webinar, maybe someone signed up for a webinar and never showed up, um, payment page, so they are going and trying to pay. However, maybe they didn't have their boss's credit card and they couldn't complete that. Uh, pricing page, so it shows that they had you know, pretty strong intent. They are interested in looking at the pricing. And one of my favorites is the contract signature. So the client has requested a contract and then, you know, you never get it back. So throw them on an automation series and um, try to create the sense of urgency, potentially offer a um, incentive and shorten that sales cycle. So a few call outs here is, a little bit lo longer again for the B2B space. You wanna have three to five emails over the next two to three weeks delivering during the week, the work week. Man, I can't get that correct. Um, but yes, delivering during the work week. Um, you wanna empathize with their busy schedule. Typically that's going to be the excuse that they give why they haven't gotten around to it. Um, you wanna address potential roadblocks. So. Maybe it's not the time of year that they make these types of big purchases. Maybe they're still in discovery mode and they are searching at other competitors. And maybe the decision maker is just too busy currently. So you wanna to try to get out ahead of those and maybe address those in your contents. And again, that final email should be creating a sense of urgency and explaining what are the repercussions to not making this purchase and why the purchase should be top priority. 
Another one that's really good is asking, have you abandoned this project? Because then the uh, prospect thinks, no, I haven't abandoned this project. I'm going to jump in and get back to this person right away. That's been one that's worked well in some of our efforts. So shifting gears a little bit, we've got a free download, 10-point full funnel email program checklist. Kelly, talk to us about this a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So everything we just went over, those, those three points, right, those three, I would say, low-hanging fruit, high-impact items for your program are not by any means the only things you should be doing in your program, right? So we have a list here. This also is not a comprehensive list of everything that you could be doing, but if you are doing all of these 10 things and you're doing them well and they are optimized, you're in a pretty good spot, right? You're, you're an email marketing expert. That's what I would consider you. So um, this will give you a really quick reference just to run through, audit your own program, see if you're missing anything. It'll give you some tips there on the right. So feel free to download it and just go through your program and see where, where you kind of come up with that. And we'll also send it out to everybody who joined today. We really appreciate your time. So at this point, we're gonna jump into questions. If you have a question and you didn't put it in the chat, drop it in the chat now, the, the question area of the chat. And wow, we had a lot of stuff come through. I, I love these questions. Thank you so much for being engaged. This is one of the most questions I, I think I've ever seen um, on, on a webinar recently. So this is really great. So um, first one, would you combine all three or choose the mat or pop-up with the nano? So, I, you know, it seems like, it, you know, can it be too much? Kelly, would you like to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that. Absolutely. I would absolutely recommend testing the pop-up versus the welcome mat. So I would not recommend having the pop-up, the welcome mat, and a nano bar. Um, the welcome mat is really a variation of the pop-up. So test between those, see which one converts at a higher rate, go with that, and then have the nano bar as that static follow-up if someone closes out of either the welcome mat right, or the pop-up. Awesome. Next question. Does WordPress have plugins that let me make these email acquisition tools on my own website? Lauren, would you like to take that one? Yes. I mean, I would say that they definitely do have it. It all depends on what tools you are currently using and what your ESP is or your email service provider is and how those APIs are integrating together. But Again, pending what you what tools you're using, it absolutely can be automated and all interacted and connected. Great answer. And just and briefly, Sumo, Optin Monster, awesome. You can map them directly to your ESP, and um, that's something we do a lot of around here. And so the the other question, what tools are you using to execute the various opt-in strategies? Those are a couple. But but I would also open it up to you, Kelly. You know, ESP tech, like you know, what what do we like to kind of work with, like it, tools wise in, in general? Yeah, I'm gonna stress this is so important. The first thing when you're deciding what ESP you should be using for your brand is to look at your CRM or your ecom platform. So there has been more times than not where someone chooses an ESP that doesn't play nicely, so to speak, with their um, current e-commerce platform or their uh, CRM system. So it's very important that you do a little bit of, you can come to us and ask us the question, but outside of that, um, if you're trying to look on your own, do a little research, right? Google your specific CRM or your e-commerce platform and see what it, ESPs integrate out of the box with that that's going to be really important otherwise you are going to have a lot of custom development work that needs to be done which of course as you know can incur higher costs take a lot longer to get things going so you know for one just out, if you if anyone's using shopify here um that is you know a platform on the e-com space that works really well plays really nicely with Clavio. that's one that we use a lot here so definitely recommend that and there's a lot of different integrations um that some of the bigger esps will play nicely with. So that's my kind of rule of thumb there. Thank you. The next one, this is a great question. Let's all think about this question for a minute. Which email address acquisition format would you recommend if you already have a chat tool that pops up? I was actually looking at a website yesterday that had this. And just a quick thought, you know, with a lot of these pop-up tools, you can show 
pop-ups based off of time, when they came in, you know, how long they've been on the site. It can be a nudge. You can set up a series of different pop-ups that come in after they've visited the site at a certain amount of time. But, you know, a lot of people invest a lot in these chat tools and some of them are really cool. Some of them are actually integrated with their advertising strategy as well. That can help a, a ton when they've got a great chat. Lauren, you have any thoughts on that? And then we can hand it over to Kelly if um, she has any. Yeah, yeah. I'd also um, recommend potentially testing exit intent pop-ups. So maybe not coming at them right away when they come onto your website and that chat is available for them to uh, engage with, but maybe after they've searched around, they have done some shopping and they are about to leave a page, you can also have a pop-up come up that's maybe asking them a question or offering them an uh, incentive to stay and make a purchase. So I would just recommend that as another uh, strategy if you do have the chat. Love it. Yeah. Kelly? Yeah, and I'll kind of jump in here too. So, you know, exit intent, fantastic strategy to test into. Will it work for everybody really well? No, you know, so I mean, definitely test it. I would say if you have a chat, think about what someone is going to interact with more. We, I've actually seen this with a couple brands. So, um, you know, a lower percentage of people are actually going to engage with a chat feature than with a pop-up. So it may be worth testing. And I'm not saying get rid of the chat feature by any means, but testing the appearance. I know you can change the appearance of how your chat, um, you know, bot kind of pops up. You can leave it as just like a little static, you know, chat icon at the bottom that doesn't pop out and disturb anyone. Then you could still utilize the pop-up and test that. But I would say if you don't want to overwhelm right in the beginning, what you could have is utilizing the nano bar, which is kind of that static bar that offers the incentive. So it's always there no matter what page someone is on. It's very, you know, minimally intrusive, right? If someone wants to take advantage of it, they can. And it doesn't interact in any way with the chat feature. So you could easily have both. Yeah, in, in my experience, the pop-ups convert better than the chat, but if you have a chat that's built to allow transactions and virtual reality and people to try things on within the chat and it's integrated in your ad strategy, you know, you can essentially also create a landing page where a pop-up could lead to that. Um, so you got to kind of think it through. You got to map the whole thing out and really interesting conversations there, but, you know, just thinking about the, the user experience. You know, another um, one that we had that came in, Lauren, have you done any testing on the number of fields present on forms and conversion rates, especially in the B2B space? So say anything around there you want to comment on? Yes, I would. Obviously, I will always say the the, the fewer the fields, the better. However, that's there's kind of a sweet spot that has a little bit more fields that is doing a better job vetting the leads. And also, I would consider testing a two-step process. Um, so you engage them to maybe give their email and name. And once they then submit that, they go to another secondary form that they will maybe provide their company name, their industry, their job title. Those are, you know, some some gold information right there. But because they have already invested in that first submission on the first page, they have a higher uh, probability of actually submitting the entire form rather than just one long form. So I would say definitely test the two-step um, and try to keep it as minimal as possible. Love the two-step. I really, really agree with that. It helped a, a lot on a couple of projects I worked on. I want to mention one thing. We turned on exit pop-ups on a really high volume client and it increased their overall conversions by 14%. It completely changed their business. Such a quick, easy win. Try to do it um, as much as possible. So I just want to let you know that number. That's a big number. So here's a question from Luis. What about AMP emails? I, that's a really interesting question. I, I know that those got hot a, a little while ago. Kelly, how are you feeling about AMP emails right now? Yeah, you know, it's, this comes up a lot actually right now for us just in the space with our partners when we're having discussions. So it's becoming more and more, you know, widely used and adopted. Is it, is it, used enough to where I would say really put a lot of focus on it. Not yet. Will it get there? I'm not sure. I think what's really important when any kind of new functionality, 
you know, comes into this space. So think there's actually a lot of cool stuff that, that can be done within an email, right? That interactivity where you can actually add to cart within an email where you can do a quiz, right? Write in an email. This is fantastic engagement within the email, but you also have to take into consideration what you can do and what you should do. <laughs> I know that's, that's always the question that I think today we're all so strapped for time and we're all so busy. I think that there needs to be a discussion around what is the lift for this extra functionality, right? It's additional code, it's a different type of coding, it's a lot of testing, right? Making sure that it renders appropriately when you're using new functionality and new technology across the different devices, A, make sure you're doing that in general, but especially when talking about AMP, a lot of testing needs to be done. So if you have the lead time, if you have the resources to put into that, and you are weighing that trade-off, what type of send is this? Is this a major email that you're getting out about a, you know, a brand new product launch or something that's going to be very impactful? Then maybe it is one that you spend you know, extra resources on. But I'd say if you, know, you don't have that extra resources or that lead time ready, it's something that we right now don't see a lot of difference in terms of overall conversions that are driven from those emails. So kind of a gray area. Really well said. And, and with AMP in general, there's a lot of things you can do with AMP, right? Build web pages and stuff. Be really careful with that one. I, we could we could talk a lot about that. I think maybe we'll, we'll even do a future webinar. So everybody, um, there's a lot of questions here. I love them. It's such great engagement, such a cool advanced webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have more questions, we didn't get a chance to answer them, just email me directly, john at ignitevisibility.com, j-o-h-n at ignitevisibility.com. We'll make sure that they get answered. Be happy to do that for you. We're gonna wrap up today, but before we do, one more exciting quick thing. Kelly, I wanna hear from you, just kind of top takeaways for email in 2021 and any other just things that you want people to keep in mind um, before we conclude today. Yeah, you know, looking into this year, um, a couple things come to mind. Number one, which you're going to hear me say over and over again if you ever talk to me, <laughs> is um, focus on behaviorally triggered automations. These are relevant emails. They make sense to the customer. They convert at six times higher rates. Really kind of shift your focus away from this batch and blast strategy that I think people are still focused on their promotional calendar so much. You need both sides of the coin there. So really kind of shift your focus there. And then two, really after last year and still going into this year with everything going on in the world, really make sure that your marketing um, you know, includes empathy, right? We see that with a lot of brands right now. So when you're putting messages together and you're going into this year around holidays and around different kinds of themes, just make sure that empathy kind of follows you in that. I think it's going to do really well for everyone in this space. Very exciting. I love the nitty gritty and, and the impact you can have on your sales online by really focusing on these details, everybody. Be excited about it, right? This is the coolest part of digital marketing. Lauren, over to you. Same question. Anything you feel like you didn't hit on or that you just really want people to know who are on the line? Um, I would say putting together a very, very robust A-B and uh, testing program, um, data-driven decisions not, oh, I feel this is going to work well, I feel this looks good. That's all great and you're, you know, it might, that might be true, but really testing it out and having a program in place that is systematically testing is really important to ensure that you are having a successful email program. I love it. I always say the future of the internet is who can convert traffic online for less because it gives you a competitive advantage. Everybody, uh, you know, throw it in the chat if you don't mind. Just a big thank you to Kelly and Lauren for all their time today and putting this together. Kelly and Lauren, we really appreciate it. Everybody, thank you so much for joining. John, J-O-H-N at ignitevisibility.com. I'd be happy to take any questions and get you to the right person. Um, if you need any help with your email marketing, we're always around, but always just uh, enjoyed learning with you today. Thanks so much, everybody. Signing off. Talk to you soon. Goodbye.